Good evening. I'm Jessica Miller, formerly on the Education Committee. Glad to step in uh, in a pinch to help out this evening. I'm delighted to introduce Angie Hong. Um, I've been uh, we've been following each other around doing great work in the Twin Cities um, for quite some time now, and I know I'm pretty excited to see her share her passion tonight. My uh, most recent experience has been following her TikTok videos, and it's been pretty fun to see the passion behind those videos. So tonight, uh, Angie's going to share that passion uh, in her in her presentation, creating pockets of habitat with native plants. Thanks, Angie, for being here tonight. It's really yeah. good to see you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you for inviting me. I was just um, enjoying hearing from everybody uh, where you are from and what you've been seeing in your gardens and what the questions are that you've been having that helps me to get an idea of um, just kind of how to package this presentation. So I am um, going to be talking tonight about creating pockets of habitat with native plants and we'll hopefully give you all sorts of ideas of wonderful native plants that you can include in your yards and gardens and also some good resources for how you can get started if you are new to this world of native gardening. I saw a lot of familiar faces and I know that some of you who have been um, involved in wild ones for years, you know even more about native plants than I do. So please feel free to crowdsource the answers to questions. Um, I'm not a botanist. I am an environmental educator and uh, you know have a lot of personal and professional experience working with native plants. But don't ask me for the, um, the scientific names to the plants because I will not be able to tell you those. Um, so a little bit about myself. I coordinate the East Metro Water Resource Education Program, which is on the east side of town, as the name might imply. And it is a local government partnership with 25 partners. I'll highlight a few of those in a moment. Um, and I'm your typical outdoor loving kind of person. So I enjoy uh, triathlons, which means I'm out there swimming, biking, and running a lot um, and just basically exploring the prairie woods and waters of our area. And I hear that you will all be just kind of putting questions in the chat. So Jessica, just feel free to like pop in and say, stop Angie, if I'm going too quickly and it seems like an opportune time to answer a question. Um, so where my office is located is at the Washington Conservation District. Uh, the Conservation yeah. District is a countywide local unit of government which serves Washington County, established in 1942. Uh, for a little bit of history, if you are not aware of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, they were all established in the wake of the Dust Bowl. And the idea was to have an entity that could work with farmers on conservation practices to prevent that kind of environmental catastrophe from happening again. So almost every county in the state has a soil and water conservation district with the exception ironically of um, Hennepin and Ramsey counties, which both of their conservation districts have dissolved and um, the county has taken on those roles. But if you live out in Washington County, our office offers free site visits to any landowners. Um, we help people to kind of navigate what can sometimes be a complicated grant programs, you know, there's state grants, there's federal grants, there's local grants, um, just helping people figure out what it is that they might qualify for. And then we do lots and lots of education outreach workshops throughout the year. So then I mentioned that we have all these other partners that I'm also working with on a regular basis. And um, there are in Washington County, eight different wow. watershed management areas. Wow. And so we have seven watershed districts, one WMO, and uh, all of these watersheds pool their funds together to have a shared education program so that we're all working together. Um, the 15 big cities in the county are also all part of this program. Um, so just a little bit of you know, framing for this conversation about creating uh, pockets of habitat is pockets of habitat for who or for what? Uh, in the St. Croix Valley, which is kind of my, my world, I like to think of things in terms of the watershed, the St. Croix watershed, we have 320 species of birds that call the St. Croix Valley home, and 60 of them are classified as species of greatest conservation need. 
So both the St. Croix River and the Mississippi River, they're really important migratory corridors. And you'll probably be noticing now that it's fall, there's lots and lots of birds that are going to start coming through that you don't see at other times of the year. Ones that maybe are up north in northern Minnesota, they're up in Canada, they're flying through on their way south. And you'll also probably notice that the birds that do stick around, they're really busy right now, gathering lots of seeds, kind of trying to fatten up for the winter. Uh, approximately 43% of the threatened and endangered plants and animals in the US live in or depend on wetlands. So this is another like really important habitat that we are trying to protect in Minnesota. Um, I'm not sure for you all, are you seeing like a gray bar at the top where I have this like navigation panel? I don't know how to make it hide. So, okay, I won't worry about it. <laughs> we'll, um, in terms of butterflies, which seemed to be a question in the introductions, um, we have 146 species of butterflies that live in Minnesota. So it's not just monarchs, even though monarchs are very well beloved, um, but we have a lot of different butterflies and moths that do live in our state. Unfortunately, and this is where it's also unfortunate that we have this gray bar that is probably for you covering the very top part here. Um, the eastern monarch populations have decreased pretty dramatically over the past uh, 20 or so years, and that's something that is concerning, that we are losing habitat in all portions of the world where monarchs live, both down in Mexico where they overwinter and up here in Minnesota and other places where they live during the summertime. Um, we also know, and those of you who have been to previous native gardening, habitat restoration kind of presentations have probably seen these images before. We also know that the native habitat is far less than it used to be. So this is an image that was put together. What you are looking at is um, kind of a map of the Twin Cities metro area. So I'll just use my cursor to outline to give you an idea of what this is. Like this is Washington County here. So we have, this is the Mississippi River running through. This is the Minnesota River running through. This is the St. Croix River. So you can kind of pick out, this is like where downtown St. Paul is, downtown Minneapolis is. Um, as recently as only 150 years ago, this entire area was natural habitat. So we had a mix of big woods, oak savanna, prairie, wet meadows. And when we look at the same area today, it's pretty obvious that we don't have much left anymore. Um, we do find some remaining native plant communities and pockets along the riverways up in the northeastern portion of Anoka County and that kind of like Anoka sand plain area, some of the wetlands and other places that haven't been able to be developed. But all of this um, gives us kind of extra motivation to make our yards be part of the solution and part of the way that we help to reconnect these lost, lost um, habitats. So just to help orient you as to things that I am going to talk about, I'm gonna talk just briefly about wildlife needs. Uh, then we're gonna start with trees and shrubs, move on to pollinator friendly gardens, give a little bit of um, you know, tips and tricks for making your native gardens have better curb appeal. And then since it is fall, I'm gonna end with some suggestions for water, wildlife friendly fall gardening. Uh, and then of course, resources, resources to help you get started. Okay, so wildlife needs. And just take a look at these four pictures. The one in the upper left-hand corner is my house. That's where I live. <laughs> Um, so wildlife needs, um, food, water, shelter, space, and take a look at these pictures and just think to yourselves, uh, what kind of wildlife might be able to find these four components, food, water, shelter, space in these different scenarios. So scenario one, the castle somewhere in, I don't know, Bordeaux, France, um, you know, with the, with the rambling lawn, this might also be a, a um, you know, highly manicured suburban conventional lawn. We really wouldn't expect to find just about anything that would find food, water, shelter, and space in that kind of, um, in that kind of space. 
So if we move on to the next picture, we are looking at number two is, hey, maybe if we take that lawn and we add in some flowering nectar species. So we might add in some clover and, um, you know, some creeping thyme and self-heal, some of those other things make it into a bee-friendly lawn. That's getting better. And I certainly don't want to like discourage anybody from doing that. But if you think about what kind of wildlife would live in a place like that, we're still really only taking care of, you know, some bees, maybe some ladybugs, uh, you know, a variety of insects, maybe some little mice and shrews. That's going to be about it. We're not really going to expect to see other kinds of wildlife. Um, moving down. Yes. Did I hear a, a jump in for a question? Okay. Um, moving down to the picture number three, this is where we start to make the magic happen. Um, when you can create a native garden that has, you know, different levels of plants and is deep and has, you know, these pockets of protection in it, that's when you start to provide habitat for the birds and the smaller animals. And, um, you know, of course, a just much of a wider variety of pollinating insects. And then, you know, that last step, most of us aren't going to be able to create that in our own backyards. Um, you know, that's a photo that I took at Beaver Creek Valley State Park. When we have large areas, that's obviously our ideal, that we can support this whole diversity of wildlife. Most of us, if you're going to have, you know, a quarter, an eighth of an acre of yard, option number three is going to be your goal. That's kind of the best thing you can hope to get to. And it's pretty. It's really pretty. Um, so I would like to start not with flowers, but with talking about trees and shrubs, because I think if you're thinking of how to transform your yard into a habitat and not just how to create a pretty garden, you would always want to use trees and shrubs as your anchor point. That's actually what's going to provide the biggest habitat value for the most species and then just kind of build your build your other um, landscape components out from there. So as Wild Ones members or enthusiasts, you are of course all undoubtedly familiar with this book by Doug Talami, Bringing Nature Home. And in this book, which came out, gosh, this is like 10 or 15 years ago now, he talked about the critical role of having trees and shrubs that are native to your area because they provide a place for the insects native to your area to lay their eggs, which become the larva that the birds eat. Um, so in this weird way, we're creating like a banquet of bugs in order to get the birds. And some of the tree species that are really, really good at bringing in lots of bugs, which then in turn creates a really good food source for birds, I'm going to highlight here. Um, so we've got hackberry, nannyberry. These are kind of smaller trees. Pagoda dogwood. This is one that grows well in the shade. A lot of times I have people ask about, you know, what would grow well in the shade. This is a great option. Um, hazelnut. That's also edible, as you can guess. Um, hawthorn. I'm going to share this one because it, this is kind of what I chose as the center point, center point in my own yard. Um, this hawthorn is growing right smack dab in the middle of the front yard. And so it is just about 10 years old now because we planted it right when we moved in. And it's not really a very common tree that I think a lot of people put in their yards, but I absolutely love it because it's beautiful throughout the year. It gets these really nice flowers in the spring. You can tell it brings in lots of bees in the springtime. It's just kind of a nice, you know, shady green tree during the summertime. It gets really pretty red leaves in the fall. And then I almost love it most of all during the winter time because it has these just dazzling red berries that create a really nice pop of color when everything else looks all boring and gray. So Hawthorne, that's a good one. Um, wild Plum, this is another one that has those nice um, flowers in the springtime. Red Osier Dogwood, the dogwoods are starting to look really beautiful right now in the fall. Black Cherry, White pine, and as I'm going down this list, I'm getting, um, picture me going higher and higher on the list of ones that are better and better for birds, basically. Uh, we've got red maple, and then kind of the granddaddy or grandmama of them all is the white oak. These oaks are going to be larval hosts to, I think it's around 435 different species of insects. 
Um, so, you know, an oak is just a really great cornerstone species, but of course, as we all know, they're really slow to grow. Um, so just some good ideas for trees and shrubs that are beneficial to pollinators. These are ones that are going to have some kind of flowers. These are a good one to have to have a flowering nectar species during the springtime for trees. We've got willows, basswood, service berry, pagoda dogwood, plum, cherry, hawthorn, and apple. And then under shrubs, blueberry, raspberry, dwarf bush, honeysuckle, black chokeberry, elderberry, red twig, dogwood, nine bark, button bush, cranberry, spirea, and currants. So there's lots. There's lots and lots to choose from. Um, Jessica, are there any questions that I should stop and answer right now before I keep barreling on? I haven't seen any questions. Let's see. Oh, here we go. You mentioned the white oak is a burr oak as beneficial as the white oak? Yes. Yep. They're both equally beneficial. Excellent. And uh, just to say it out loud, go ahead and put questions in the chat and then we'll get good stopping points. I'll be keeping an eye on those and be able to direct them to Angie. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we talked about using the trees and the shrubs as kind of a cornerstone for whatever you're going to build out from habitat in your yard. I found, oh gee, let me um, real quick stop the share because I don't think that I included, um, I don't think that I remembered to hit share sound. There we go. Okay. Oop, there we are. Um, this is, I just thought it was the cutest little video that was put together by Prairie Restorations. And um, there are tons of different native plant retailers. Uh, so don't think that this is the only one, but I just thought this was just a really nice little one minute long video helping to show how our yards can, you know, help to create these little pockets of habitat. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that right now. Hopefully. I'm laughing to myself because right as that was playing, then I, I realized that it was actually Minnesota Native Landscapes that put together that video, not for restorations, as I incorrectly said. Um, like I said, though, there are many, many different uh, native plant retailers in our area. And I know that Wild Ones, in fact, has a really great list on, um, on the Wild Ones website of who some of those native plant retailers are. Um, so I just want to think kind of through the lens of, you know, one or two of these keystone species and, um, you know, what does it look like when we start reconnecting pockets of habitat? So most of you by now have heard about the rusty patch bumblebee, which is newly listed as a federally endangered species. It's also the new Minnesota state bee. Woohoo! 
Um, so what does a rusty patch bumblebee need? It needs um, places where it can nest in the ground. It needs blooming native flowers throughout the growing season. It needs connected high quality habitat and protection from insecticides and fungicides. Uh, in the Midwest, we have some of the remaining patches of habitat that support the rusty patch bumblebee. And in particular in Washington County, we've got a couple of pretty good sized chunks where we have um, you know, landscape that should be able to support the rusty patch bumblebee. They are occasionally found, but not as often as they ought to be. Uh, and yet, these are not by any means the only bees that live in Minnesota. I think we have somewhere around 400 species of bees. Jessica would be able to tell you better than I. Um, but you know, 3,600 known bee species in the US. And there's just this whole world of bees that are out there that are performing the pollinating services. Um, so, for example, Metropolitan Blooms has looked at, you know, what if they were to build off of areas of existing known high quality habitat, kind of add a buffer of 200 meters for the distance that a rusty patch bumblebee or another small pollinator could fly. And, you know, what does that look like? That's what this middle picture is showing us. Um, you know, it's doing a pretty good job already of creating you know, kind of a corridor that an insect might be able to travel along those lakes and the riverways. Um, but if they added in the people who have come to workshops and have gone on to build native gardens or rain gardens in their yards, all of a sudden you see this whole map lights up green. So even though you or I might only be able to make little pockets of habitat, if we all do it, it really does add up to a big benefit. Uh, we've looked at the same kind of thing in Washington County, where we have identified where existing high habitat or high quality habitat is, and then kind of zeroed in on, well, you know, for example, if we've got um, this chunk around Lake Elmo Regional Park, who are the landowners we might most want to work with and help them to get some additional habitat installed to be able to connect those corridors. Um, so moving on to talking about the part people get most excited about, which is the pollinator friendly gardens. This is when we get to talk about flowers. And this is just a lovely garden uh, from a master gardener who lives in Lake Elmo, Bonnie Duran. She also uh, raises monarch butterflies and has tons and tons of varieties of milkweed that she's always kind of cultivating in her yard. So if you're thinking about the rusty patch bumblebee in particular, since that's one that we began talking about, um, you could choose seven different flowers and have them all in a garden. And these would provide a really great nectar source for the rusty patch bumblebee, but also for all sorts of other pollinating insects. Uh, so wild bergamot, Virginia bluebells, goldenrod, blazing star, hyssop, columbine, and aster. This would be, you know, this really nice palette that would bloom throughout the year. Uh, with rusty patch bumblebees and with all pollinators, it's going to be really important to have a nectar source throughout the year. So not just during the summertime. You want to think about having things that will bloom in the spring and things that will bloom into the fall. And then one of the things that we don't talk about as much is that it's not just about what you plant, but also what else is there in your yard. A lot of the native bee species in Minnesota are ground nesters. They don't live in colonies the way honeybees do. There might just be one of them or a very small grouping of them. And so they need to have little bare patches of soil to go down and get into their, um, you know, into their place where they're overwintering or their place where they are laying their eggs. Uh, so let's talk about the flowers. <laughs> let's talk about the pretty things that you can plant in your yard that are native, are going to provide great blooms and uh, provide some nice nectar and um, habitat for the, for the birds and the bees and the butterflies. Just to kind of rapidly run through these, if you have shade to part shade, here are just a few examples of flowers that you can choose from, flowers and plants, I should say, not just flowers. Um, the wild geranium is the one that has this nice purple flower. Uh, the columbine gets these nice little red bell-shaped flowers. 
Um, the Culver's root has these kind of crazy looking white ones. Uh, and then I always tell people that in the shade, you're really also going to want to be thinking about texture. So thinking about different ferns and different sedges that you can plant because the shade plants are going to bloom really early in the year. And then most of the rest of the year, they're just going to be green. So you want things that look pretty even when they're not blooming. Um, continuing on with partial shade to partial sun, these things that are kind of on the edges. Um, again, the Culver's root, the turtle head, another kind of sedge, we've got the sprinkle sedge, um, the blue lobelia, the bottle gentian, just some you know fun different ones. I always say the sky's the limit when you're going full sun uh, because there's just any number of different flowers that would grow in a prairie that you could also grow in your yard. Um, the anise, anise hyssop, I'm just gonna single that one out because I have it in my yard and it's like bumblebee candy. Um, so there's always bumblebees just all over that one. And just a few more options in terms of full sun, things that are going to do great in a full sun area and provide lots of good habitat and nectar. Um, the blazing stars, if you have you know, a prairie blazing star, a metal blazing star, these are going to bring monarchs in like crazy. So even though the monarchs will lay their eggs only on the milkweed, they will use a whole bunch of other kinds of flowers for a nectar source. So having those will bring the monarchs to your yard for sure. Uh, because, because it's fall. <laughs> I thought I should highlight also a few plants that you can put in your yard that are gonna look really pretty in the fall because sometimes we focus a lot on Things that, you know, we're always thinking about the garden as if it only exists in July and um, things that are going to look really pretty in July. But we also want to have things that look really pretty when it comes to be September and October. Um, so goldenrods, these are a nice thing that is happening at this time of year. Um, you know, there is the stiff goldenrods that are growing in the prairies and you probably see them all over the place, the Canada goldenrod. Um, maybe you have a shadier area and you can consider having a zigzag goldenrod. I've got that in my yard because it's pretty shady. It's got a pretty different look to it, but still brings um, lots of bees to the yard. There's any number of different kinds of asters. There's asters that come in blue and purple and white. And, um, you know, some of them are short and some of them are tall and some of them bunch up and some of them are lanky. So there's lots of different asters to choose from. They're all late bloomers. Um, the blue bottle gentian. I just think these are really cool. Uh, they never open up. They just always look like that all the time. But a bumblebee can buzz at just the right frequency that it's able to get itself in there and be able to, um, you know, to get to the nectar and the pollen on the inside. Sneezeweed, it doesn't make you sneeze. I don't know why they named it that, but it's a perfectly nice flower and it blooms at this time of year. Um, and then there's also, you know, just bushes and shrubs that have really nice color at this time of year, uh, sumac and dogwood. Uh, sumac I would only plant if you have a pretty large property. I wouldn't recommend that for a small residential lot, um, but the, you know, the dogwood's got some nice color. And of course the prairie grasses are really pretty too. So little blue stem and other prairie grasses. Um, and I believe it was Bob was asking in the middle or in the beginning, you know, if I was only going to plant a few things, what is it that I should plant? Because um, I just shared all sorts of flowers and that can be overwhelming. You certainly couldn't put those all in a garden. Um, Tom Dick, who, who is a volunteer with Wild Ones, has put together his recommendations for what you could do if you had just a small 10 by 10 native pocket prairie garden. So the plants are organized by height and time of bloom. Um, and he has them laid out in this little grid like this. So you could think about if you put it in the front, the middle or the back and what time of year you can expect to see them blooming. Um, so just to read through what ones are on this list, Golden Alexander, Wild Geranium, Prairie Smoke, Columbine, Jacob's Ladder, Swamp Milkweed, Gray-Headed Coneflower, American Bellflower, Pale Purple Coneflower, Pergamot Foxglove, Blue-Eyed Grass, Wild Onion, Hairy Wood Mint, I guess there's a lot more than just five, huh? Um, <laughs> Showy Golden Around New England, Aster Sneezeweed, Cardinal Flower, Blue Mobilia, Metal Blazing Star, Bottle Gentian, Aromatic Aster, and Wild Petunia. You could probably pick one from each of those boxes instead of all three from each of those boxes. All right, 
I think there might be two questions, Jessica. Indeed, one question, um, how are the non-native hyssop for um, bumblebee or rusty patch um, food yes. resources? Oh, the non-native hyssop. Um, I do not know the answer to that question specifically. Um, there are a lot of these native flowers that there are cultivated versions of them that have a lot of the same characteristics, but not always all of the same characteristics. So another good example is the bee balm. A lot of people have the red cultivated version in their yard instead of the purple native version. Um, and they still have good qualities, but uh, I think that a lot of times they don't have as high of nectar quality, but I don't know what that one for sure. Um, I don't know what the research says on that one. And do you know anything about um, how, if, if insects or something would reflect um, you know, like something comes to the red Monarda that doesn't come to my paler ones, or like that might be my powers of observation. Do you know if they would yeah. stop going to it? Like some flowers are naughty attractors, even if they have no nectar. <laughs> I know, I know, I've heard that, but um, it's not, yeah, it's not an area of expertise for me. So I guess I wouldn't be able to, to say, you know, rattle off off the top of my head, which ones do that and don't. Fair enough. I always figure yeah. the insects kind of reflect. Yeah. If there's no insects on it, huge clue. It's not doing as much as you want. Yeah. Um, Carl Forrester grasses, are those native grasses? Um, those are not a native grass, uh, but they are very often used in landscaping. And they're one of the ones that I would say has a lot of great qualities. Like they have deep roots. They're great for erosion control. They're very hardy. We use them a lot of times in rain gardens. They're fairly salt tolerant. So, um, you know, they are good, but they're not one that natively grew in the Minnesota prairie. So maybe not eaten as much, but definitely yeah. habitat creating. Yeah. And then I comment that hummingbirds also forage on the bottled gentian. Oh, yeah. And, oh, is sun or shade required for the 10 by 10 um, plantings? Oh, hey, that is a really great question. Um, looking at what he's got here, it looks to me like this is a mix because some of them, like the Columbine, the wild geranium, um, those are ones that, you know, the blue lobelia, those are ones that will grow in those, you know, shady part shade areas. Um, but then there's some like metal blazing star that definitely seem to be sunny. So I think that you'd probably have to kind of cross-reference this, um, you know, look, look these flowers up and see if they are sunny or shady ones before you pick which ones are going to do best for your yard. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, shall I move on to cues for care? Yes, do it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I have found um, over the years that one of the things that often keeps people from planting more natives in their yard is a fear of having their yards look messy, a fear of their neighbors not liking the way their yards look, and so I would like to offer some kind of tips for how to make the gardens look more like gardens. And I'm, like nature looks really beautiful when you're at a state park, but if it looked just like that in your yard, it sometimes doesn't look the way we want it to. Um, so just some, we kind of call them cues for care. One of them is to use clean edges and um, rocks or some kind of hardscaping when you're able to, because these will help to make your garden look more intentional and help to uh, communicate to other people in your neighborhood, like, yes, this is something I purposefully planted. It's not just, you know, an overgrown lawn. Um, so it could be a cut edge, it could be a brick edge, it could be a sidewalk edge, you know, or it could, this is much more expensive, but it could be something like, you know, those rock boulders that you see in the right hand photo. Uh, you know, whatever the case is, that that's, something that helps to make it look more like a garden. Um, if you are planting in an area like a boulevard, this is like the widest boulevard strip I think I've ever seen. Um, you know, my boulevard strip at home is much smaller, but a lot of times people will leave the edges around the boulevard strip as mowed grass. 
And that helps to prevent the plants from flopping over into the road or into the sidewalk. Uh, I don't have my boulevard strip at home isn't wide enough to be able to have a, um, an edge like that. So I do actually fairly frequently end up having to go out there and cut the plants that flopped over into the sidewalk. And I just figure that's a nice way of having, having a never ending bouquet for my house, never ending bouquets of flowers. Um, some of the other things you can think about is how you mix your native plants with the plants that you may already have in your yard or with uh, some of those more natural areas in your yard. So for example, at this home, just the stuff that is closest to where you're looking is um, new native plants that they planted and then they kind of had this pre-existing wooded area. And so they blended it together instead of having like, here's the wooded area, here's my garden. Things just kind of blend seamlessly together and you see it kind of go from shorter to taller as you move back. Um, front loaded with flowers and there are, you know, walking paths and edges. So it, it helps it to not just look like, um, you know, not just look, look like a wild area. It looks very intentional and pretty that way. Um, along shoreline areas, you can't have an edge on the side that's the lake, you know, that's the side that's going to be moving the most often, but having a hard edge on the lawn side or on the house side can help. This is another example where they um, front loaded the flowers. So from the house view, you see lots of flowers. And then as you get down closer to the shoreline, it gets to be more of those kind of sedges and grasses. Um, but the other thing you might notice from looking at this is that the colors are grouped together. So instead of um, just broadcast seeding and having you know flowers coming up here, there and everywhere, which looks great in a prairie, um, you can group things together and it, it, it's more pleasing to the eye usually. That, that's usually the way people prefer for the garden to look, to have that nice, you know, yellows are here and purples are here and reds here and it's a nice pop of color that way. Uh, just to share an example from somebody who has a larger yard. Uh, we work with a lot of, you know, quite large landowners out in Washington County. So this is an example in Stillwater Township where the homeowner had one acre and they were mowing it all the way down to that little pond that's down there. It's a steep slope. They didn't want to continue mowing um, and it transitions from dry to wet. So they kind of said, hey, what can we do? And our landscape restorationist put together this, which I think is so beautiful and about a hundred times more pretty than, um, than the previous. But it, it kind of follows some of these principles of having the, you know, the color front loaded. So when you are in the house, you're looking out, you see lots of flowers. As it gets closer down to the pond, it's a lot more just, um, you know, grasses and sedges. But you don't, you know, then it just kind of begins to seamlessly blend in with the native habitat that's back there already. Um, so. I'm gonna back up here. Was there a couple more questions before I move on to fall gardening tips? I don't see any questions in the okay. chat. Okay, great. Okay, since it is fall, I wanted to offer just a few parting tips. Um, this is the time of year when people start getting busy, busy, busy in their yards. And some of the things that we do in our yards are necessary. And some of them are things that we just kind of do by habitat or by habitat, by habit. I've said that word too many times tonight. Um, some of these things are just things we do by habit that don't really need to be done and can sometimes actually be harmful. Uh, so one of the things that all of us start feeling like we need to do at this time of year is cutting down all of those dried flowers after all the petals have fallen off and it's just standing there and it's got the seed heads and it doesn't look that pretty anymore. Um, you know, feel free to cut some of them back to, you know, if your yards are like mine, it's kind of gotten to the point where it's like out of control by this time of year, you know, so feel free to like trim and, you know, cut it back to a nice size, but do leave a lot of those up for the fall and the winter and even into the early spring because it's going to provide seed source for the birds and there's a lot of insects that will lay their eggs inside the stems of these plants and 
they're going to overwinter. The uh, eggs will hatch into larva in the early spring, and it's not going to be until the fairly late spring, uh, end of April, early May, when the temperatures are above 50 degrees, that they're finally going to emerge. So if you don't leave standing dry plants, there's not going to be any kind of habitat for those birds and other beneficial insects. Um, here's another one that I <laughs> hate raking. And I was so happy when I learned that it's actually okay not to rake. Um, if you have a fairly light cover of leaves on your lawn, you can just, you know, a couple times during the fall, mow over it, mulch those leaves into the lawn, and that will return nutrients naturally into the soil. It's kind of like getting a free fertilizer dose. Uh, if you have leaves that are falling into the gardens and into the natural areas, just leave them because those are going to help to keep the soil moist during the winter time. And it's creating places for toads and salamanders and small mammals and insects to hibernate over the winter time. Um, on the topic of leaves, do not, do not, do not um, dump your leaves into the nearby wetland, the ravine, the gully, uh, the streamside buffer, any of those kinds of places, because the leaves do contain a lot of phosphorus. That is the key ingredient that causes algae to grow during the summertime. And um, so, you know, we're just working really hard to try to get that message out there that um, we need to keep the leaves away from those places and, you know, rake them out of the street too, so that they don't end up going into the storm drains and causing water pollution. Uh, this time of year is actually surprisingly a really great time to start planning and even planting a garden for next year. Um, it's actually a pretty good time of year to plant native plants. And if you are considering establishing a prairie, a bee lawn or lomo lawn, it's a great time to think about doing seeding for dormant seeding. You wouldn't want to seed um, quite yet, but if you look at early to mid-November, that's gonna be the perfect time to put down seeds for you know, prairie bee lawn, lomo, and have them be able to pop up and germinate uh, first thing in the spring when things start coming up. So <clears throat> resources to help you get started. Um, there's a whole world of resources that are already available through Wild Ones. And I know on the Wild Ones website that there is a link to a brochure that has locations of native plant retailers in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. If you aren't already familiar, Blue Thumb Planting for Clean Water, the Blue Thumb website, um, this is a really great partnership between native plant retailers, local government, nonprofit organizations. Um, and you go on the website and there's also gonna be links to native plant retailers, but there's this really cool thing called a plant selector tool. And you can use that to figure out what will grow best in your yard. So you just enter in the conditions like I have sunny and it is wet and I want it to bloom in June and poof, it will give you a list of native plants that all fit those criteria. Uh, they always have workshops and events coming on, uh, going on. There's going to be information on pollinator gardens, rain gardens, shoreline plantings, turf alternatives, and there is information about the Minnesota Lawns to Legumes grants also. Uh, Minnesota legislature just approved a third round of funding where you can apply to get up to $350 to plant some kind of um, pollinator garden or pollinator friendly planting at your home. Um, Washington Conservation District, if you're one of mine, if you live in Washington County, uh, you can sign up for a free site visit on our website. We have uh, recordings from previous workshops. We have all sorts of print resources there and something that is always really popular, the, the Blue Thumb Guide to Yard Care, um, which has just guidance on all sorts of other things related to yard and garden care. I mentioned that Lawns to Legumes program. Um, you can also find that through Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. And they've even put together some really great planting templates for planting for pollinators. And you can go in and it's just like paint by numbers um, that you look at this garden and you just you know plug in which of the plants you wanna plant there. It's got great instructions for how to prep your yard, how to prep the garden, how to get it going. Um, and 
you just follow these little designs and away you go. So that that's a really great tool as well. Um, this is that brochure from Wild Ones that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that there are actually quite a lot of native plant retailers in our area. Um, we're very lucky to have to have so many to choose from. And um, yeah, they're, you know, kind of spread up throughout the metro area and, you know, even out into greater Minnesota as well. Okay, so just a few additional resources. Um, I already mentioned the Bringing Nature Home book where Doug Flammy talked about the benefits of native plants for birds. Um, Heather Holm has two different books that are about pollinators of native plants. Um, the first book, Pollinators of the Native Plants, talks about um, you know, what the different bees and pollinating insects are that she saw. It. And then there's this book, which is just called Bees, and it includes tree, shrub, and perennial plant profiles. Uh, for different plants that will attract to different species of bees. Um, if you're super into bees, a couple of other uh, groups that you might be interested in. The Bee Lab through University of Minnesota has lots of great information and resources. Pollinator Friendly Alliance does good advocacy and fundraising around protecting pollinators. Uh, out in my neck of the woods, we have a honey bee honeybee club. There are over 100 members in this honeybee club of people who are raising and rearing bees in their home, not in their homes, but in their backyards. Um, and then the Xerxes Society is a national organization that um, is looking at protection of insects in general, but has great resources on pollinators in particular. These are two good resources if you are interested in monarchs. Um, Monarch Joint Venture and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Save the Monarch. These both have um, good resources on monarchs in particular. And um, before I kind of transition to questions, I just wanted to give you, you know, a, a parting word of hope, I guess. Um, it, it's really easy, I think, to feel overwhelmed. And I know that we're going on what, two years of crazy, crazy life. Um, so it's easy to feel overwhelmed by these big problems, but starting small, seeing how, you know, there's already so many people on this webinar tonight, um, you know, seeing how many other people are doing this work, it really does add up to a difference and an impact. So know that you're not alone and thank you for being here tonight. And there, I'm gonna, Gonna go ahead and see what questions there are. You hear the clapping of the crowd? They're going wild. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine this a thousand fold. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really lovely done. I know what we've all enjoyed um, your presentation very much. I wanted to jump right into oh Heather Holmes' third book that just came out this year. With Heather Ross. Holmes' third book, of course. <laughs> Soon we won't be able to count high enough for her wonderful insect no. in, um, of books. And then there was a, oh, um, somebody had a question about, do you have information about more grants or monies um, to help homeowners establish some of these gardens? So it depends on where you live. Um, many of the watershed districts do offer grants, um, plant grants or cost share grants to help plant native gardens and rain gardens. Generally, they're going to be a grant tied to it somehow protecting public water or water quality. So if it is a rain garden or it's a shoreline planting or it's helping to reduce erosion, that would qualify. If it's just purely planting a butterfly garden, that doesn't always qualify. Um, but the the grants vary a lot throughout the metro, so it's hard for me to give you a universal answer. Um, if you go to that Blue Thumb website, they do have a link on there where you can look at available grants around the state that people have, you know, submitted information about. If you're outside of the metro area, you're somewhere else in Minnesota, I would say your Soil and Water Conservation District is your best first stop, and they're going to be able to tell you about any grants that might be available for you. Excellent, and thank you so much for a lot of great resources. Yeah. I um, got a question about having a great native flower garden near a plain old vegetable garden. Would that attract the pollinators away from your vegetable flowers? No, no, I think that's great. 
In fact, um, I have a friend, Dawn Cape, who coined this term netable garden, and I'm going to make it be a thing. I'm, I'm making that be a thing now, netable. When you plant your natives and your edibles together, I think it's it's amazing. It's like a magical world because you're bringing the pollinators in and then they will indeed also pollinate your vegetables and your fruit and the other things that you're trying to grow. And in fact, in my front yard, I also have a lot of herbs that I will sometimes let go to flower because they have really great flowers and they end up bringing a lot of pollinators in as well. Um, so these commingles, they live very happily together. I would very much encourage you to do that. I agree. I think it's multiplicative. And also if there's any competition, the more then the, the more flowers available, the less competing and the more eating, right? Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you explain what a rain garden is? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm, I'm so used to like talking about rain gardens so much that I realized I didn't really talk about them at all in this presentation. Um, so a rain garden is basically a normal garden that is hollowed out ever so slightly, maybe like four to six inches deep and strategically placed where it's gonna catch runoff water from a rooftop downspout, a driveway, or sometimes the road, depending on where it is. Um, so you'll see you know, fairly large rain gardens that are being installed by a lot of our cities when they're doing road reconstruction work. And then also much smaller ones that tends to just blend in with the landscaping that people are putting in on their own. But the goal is that it takes water that would normally go into a street, go down the storm drain, you know, gather a bunch of pollution, end up in our lakes and rivers. And instead it goes into the garden, it can soak into the ground or get taken up by the roots of the plants and not do that, not go into the storm sewer. Um, so it, it's a really effective small scale practice for reducing stormwater pollution. I love being on everybody's team. This is, yeah. it's, it's helpful to think that every small effect really mm -hmm. adds up to be yeah. To be why we're so proud to be Minnesotans or other yeah. gardeners <laughs> taking care of the taking care of our little patches. Uh, if that somebody is interested to hear about lawn art alternatives and how to make them blend into or um, blending into neighbors' yards um, with the narrow edges of grasses around my gardens, would still like to decrease decrease grasses, but in that pleasant way of teamwork. Mm, yeah. Um, oh, that's kind of a tough one. Having lawn alternatives. I almost feel like if your neighbor, if you, if you feel like, or are fairly sure that your neighbor would not like the, um, you know, flowering species or whatever of your bee lawn creeping into their conventional lawn, then I think I would recommend having some kind of edging or even a garden, you know, that like, you can almost have like a skinny garden that's creating the border between your yard and their yard so that your alternative lawn does not also become their alternative lawn. Uh, because, you know, the last thing you want is to have your neighbor um, complaining, moaning, and that becoming, you know, a source of angst for you in your life. Do you think there's any ways to encourage ground nesters or habitat that allows those niches of space in the soil? Um, like how to encourage that? You know, I think if you have some gardens that are not, you know, entirely mulched all of the time, that's going to help. I know, you know, like I have some portions of my yard where I do try to keep it, you know, pretty much mulched all the time to keep the weed growth down. But there's some other places where, you know, it's kind of in the backyard and it doesn't really need to have mulch and I don't add mulch and you know that's like a, a nice place where you have you know and if you're okay with there being other kinds of wildlife in your yard too you know not just bees and birds I mean that is going to be the place also where you know the chipmunks and all the little mammals and things are going to be able to burrow their way into the ground and they're part of the food chain also so um yeah I would encourage finding spots like that where you can leave it unmulched and uncovered delightful I know I've been excited seeing I, I've quit raking or working any harder than I need to. And now I've got mycorrhizae connecting some Ooh, of the leaf so. litter and wood yeah. debris and things. And that, so that's been a new fungal community, too, that 
I think yeah. I should be the neighbor. <laughs> I think the mushrooms are getting eaten by a lot of the raccoons, but go team. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's all well I don't see any more questions okay. in the, the chat. Um, we're so appreciative of your time this evening. And I'll probably turn it over to the wild ones if they've got final uh, comments before uh, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Yes, no problem. It was a pleasure.